Good morning, good morning, and welcome to our worship service this morning. Thank you for joining us as we come together in the name of Christ through the Holy Spirit within us, as we come as one, as we come with open hearts and open minds to receive what he has for us in this time of worship and fellowship, and as we come to lift up our voices collectively in worship and praise for who he is and what he is in our lives. Welcome. And I know that God has a blessing for us as we come humbly expecting it. Thank you for joining us live for those of you who are able to, others who may be watching this video throughout the week. We trust that you will be blessed. We will be blessed and encouraged and empowered in your walk with Christ. Unfortunately, we can't at the present seat people in the building, as you know, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in the uh, uh, recent, in the in, 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 uh, very early time. And uh, if we can, you will certainly be the first to know. Uh, but we're very happy to have Karen with us today, Karen Christie, and she's going to be sharing a little later about missions. Let me ask God's blessing upon our meeting. Our dear God and Father, we thank you for the privilege that's ours to come together, Lord, on this morning. Father, thank you for your presence among us because you've promised that where we come together in your name, you are there because you're in us by faith. Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we come with, him, with open hearts and with hungry hearts to receive your blessing, to receive what you want to feed us upon today. And Lord, above all, we, we long for you to be glorified and lifted up. Bless and guide us in this time to your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ this week. Let's lift up our hearts, lift up our voices, and lift up his name. We let no one caught in sin remain. Inside the lie of inward shame and fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us freely you bled for us Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the dead Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Beneath the weight of all our sins you bow to none but heaven's will No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown No burden great can hold you down In strength you reign forever Let your church proclaim Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Singing, oh, death, where is 
is your sting oh hell where is your victory oh church come stand in the light our god is not dead he's alive he's alive christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. And you are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear. Our Prince of Peace, drawing us near. Jesus, our hope, living for all who will receive. Lord, we. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. And you are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shine for all the world to see you rose from the dead conquering fear our prince of peace drawing us near jesus our hope living for all who will receive lord we Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide. And 
trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. Time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great! our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God name above all names worthy of all sing how great is our God. Yes, he's the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Lord, you are great. You are the creator. Everything that we, we can see or imagine, you have you are the one who put it all in place and put it in motion. And though you are so great, so vast, so infinite, yet you choose to know us and to love us. And you choose to bless us. Today, Lord, we receive your blessing as your children, we receive your love, we receive your goodness. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace the lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace Amen 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 Face to shine upon you, 
be gracious to you. The Lord turned his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May His favor be upon you. And a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you. He is with you. Come in the evening. All around you and within you, He is with you, He is with you. Rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. blessings that we have in Christ. You are so good to us. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everybody. This morning, I want to talk about the fish and the feet. Friends, have you caught any fish? In John chapter 21, it describes the story of Jesus' appearance to the disciples in Galilee after the resurrection. How he invited them to have breakfast with him on the shore by the lake. What a special time that must have been for them. Later on in the New Testament, we read about the Apostle Paul, who planted many churches, lots of fish there. We also read how Paul describes the church as one body with many parts, with different functions, but integrated so there is support for each, all the different parts. We could think of the disciples and Paul as feet in this body of Christ, trained and sent out into the world to carry the gospel to places far and wide. And today we have people walking in their footsteps, missionaries and parachurch workers, who in a similar way are the feet in the kingdom of God. People who must rely on God's provision because they are trusting in this assignment from Jesus. 
Now, as Paul planted churches, he encouraged them in a partnership with this ongoing spread of the gospel. That partnership included hospitality, it included financial support and prayer, and he talked about personal connection to these workers. Now, Pastor Doug has asked me to be a part of the missions promotion team here in our church. Well, I do have a passion for missions, which came about as a teenager and took me into this career path for my life. My mission endeavor was through an international Christian theater company in different countries, and now it is with international students. In my travels, I have met many missionaries, and some of my dearest friends are serving in places like Kenya to orphan children, in Macedonia through a business adventure, in Germany to refugees, in Africa to Muslims, India to the Dalits, but also locally, a friend here in Enjoy Fellowship, ISMC, of course, at Union Gospel Mission, Agape Fellowship, and Youth with a Mission. I support them in ways that I can. Through our Baptist denomination, I have met CBM missionaries from the Bible College in Lebanon who came here to our church. So I could go on and on. But what I'd like to emphasize is the joy and encouragement to my faith it's come in a big part from these connections. My growth as a follower of Christ has been so enriched by people with this kingdom view. So this morning, I want to encourage you in taking on Paul's teaching to the local churches to consider more and more your own partnership with these people sent by Jesus, people who plant and water the seeds of the gospel in desert places. Our church here at Burnaby North has a specific group of missions that we take offerings for three times a year. And over Easter, we do the first one. To make it more meaningful, we sometimes highlight these missions with a guest speaker. This year, we've lowered our church missions budget and we want to promote more personal involvement where you can give directly to the mission of your choice. Be become a partner. This is better for the missions and it's better for our own growth. Now the church missions offering is significant so we continue with it and we ask don't stop and don't stop your general uh, church offerings but we also encourage you to support missions where your own heart is. And then maybe some of you can share how that's been for you. Now, I want to thank you for the support and encouragement I've received over the years from you. My part-time work with International Student Ministries Canada has been so rewarding. And many times, you have welcomed students and staff to share their stories from the pulpit. Most missionaries must raise their whole support by donations because they're not on anyone's payroll. That's a huge challenge to live by. But we see God's hand at work and through wisdom given to steward well. Lately, I have stewarded our church's giving to ISMC to a couple of our local staff. We really are a family. Izumi from Japan, who is key to our returnee work, and to a new couple, Yosef and Jessica, who will be new campus directors at SFU. When we come back together, I want to introduce you, I want to introduce Yosef and Jessica to you. We're very excited to have them on our Vancouver team. In closing, I'll share a comment from a Chinese student who became a Christian a few years ago at Focus Club at SFU. She even brought her mother back in China to Christ 
over a birthday phone call. And later, she served a year in Turkey, taking off a gap year during her studies. We call her Jane. Just a few months ago, Jane revealed to us how it all came to be, and we were really humbled to see how the Lord had brought this about. She said when she first came to the club, she stayed because of the friendliness, and she listened to the Bible discussions. Well, little did we know that inside this quiet student, she was desperate. She was depressed. And she was planning on suicide. Hope in God became her last shot. Oh, of course, she found it in Jesus and thanked us for saving her life those many years ago. Jesus asked his disciples, friends, have you caught any fish? Let's come and have breakfast with Jesus and listen to him about how he'd like each of us to become involved in missions. Amen. Thank you, Karen, for sharing with us this morning, not only sharing, but challenging us uh, in, the, in the realm of missions and reaching beyond our congregation, but even into our congregation and into our local community. I know that Karen has shared a concern that I have, and I've often shared it with our church leaders, is that during this time of COVID, it's easy to, be, it's easy to begin to turn inward and to forget that there's a big world out there that needs good news. That's one of the reasons why I'm putting a missions promotion team together. And if you'd like to know more about that, get in touch with me uh, as, our, as finding ways that we can continue to look out. We must always do that, even as we care, of course, for our core and our base here at the church. In a moment, we're going to have a prayer for our missionaries. But I want to, first of all, ask God's blessing upon our offering. Thank you for your continued support of your church and how you're standing with us during this time. And as Karen mentioned, uh, we are at this time receiving our Easter mission offering, one of three major offerings through the year that go directly, all of it goes into missions. So uh, if you've already given to that, thank you. If you'd like to, just be sure to mark your check, your envelope, your e-transfer, so that we can know what part of your offering beyond your normal offering you would like to direct into uh, missions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Lord, today, as we think about carrying the gospel, we thank you that someone brought the gospel to us. It might have been a mother or father, Sunday school teacher, a friend, a pastor. And Lord, we value that highly. And we're reminded of how important it is that we then share. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of missions financially. Lord, bless our offering to our work here in Burnaby North and our offering that goes far beyond here and around the globe. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Karen mentioned Yusuf and Jessica, and I just wanted to share this handwritten note we received from them the other day to, our Burnaby, to the Burnaby North Baptist Church. My husband Yosef and I were so humbled to receive your generous support of $500 toward our ministry with international students in Vancouver. Your gift and your prayers are so precious to us. We thank you for thinking of us and our ministry especially in this season where we recognize that there are many needs and it can feel like uh, limited resources. God is faithful to provide all things in all ways through all seasons. May the Lord richly bless you in the ministry of your church. Humbly yours in Christ, Yosef and Jessica. And we do indeed look forward to meeting them someday personally here in our building. In our pastoral, mission, pastoral prayer time, 
There are two things upon my heart. One, of course, is missions that I'll mention in a moment. But also, I, I want to just express our condolences and our prayers to our queen, Queen Elizabeth, and the royal family on the passing of Prince Philip. And as we would do with anyone, we want to remember them in our prayers as well today and through this week in their time of mourning. Praying for missions. It's not something new. It's an ancient practice. It goes back to the very first days of the church. The church in the city of Antioch was especially focused on mission of carrying the gospel beyond themselves out into their world. And in Acts 13, verses 2 and 3, we find them appointing two missionaries, Barnabas and Saul. And the record is recorded this way. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they fasted and prayed, and let me stop there to say, not just Barnabas and Saul fasted and prayed, but the implication is that the whole church fasted and prayed. They placed their hands on them and sent them off. We should pray for our missionaries. We should pray for our mission organizations. Sometimes we wonder what to pray. Well, some of the things that missionaries often tell me they want us to pray about is to pray for open doors and open hearts, for boldness in their witness, for the supernatural spread of the gospel, for protection. Many of our missionaries are in places of danger and risk today, for effectiveness in the ministry, safety and travel, and for spiritual, mental, and psychological health and refreshment. And then, as Karen also mentioned in her presentation, we encourage you to get your note to know your missionaries personally so that you can follow their work and be a part of the mission with them in meaningful ways. Let us pray. Our dear God and Father, we thank you that we have this privilege, this joy to come together. Father, to come together in prayer, because, Lord, we know there is such power as God's people humble themselves before the Almighty God and say, we can't, but you can. Humbly say, we need you, and our lives and our world is open to you. Hear our prayers, Lord. Father, we pray for the royal family, and Lord, we pray for many other families today who've lost loved ones. We especially think of those who've lost loved ones through this pandemic. Millions upon millions. Lord, the only true comfort is in knowing that Jesus overcame the grave, as we'll see this morning in our message. Father, thank you for those who share the gospel beyond the, the local church. For those who go across the street, across the city, across the country, even across the globe, to share the good news that Jesus lives. Bless them, we pray, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday, we gathered here to celebrate that wonderful, life-changing, world-changing truth that Jesus lives. Jesus lives. I think you would agree with me. I hope that you would that this is the pivotal truth for the Christian. Our faith stands or falls on this truth. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been risen. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those who have passed in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection, the truth that Jesus lives, is what we're all about. And therefore, the celebration of that truth can't just be a once a year on Easter Sunday kind of thing. But it's a truth that we celebrate as Christians every moment of every day. It is the basis, the very foundation of our faith, our hope, our very existence. 
But what I want us to see this morning is that believers understood that truth long before Jesus' resurrection. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you're following along, I invite you to join me this morning in the 16th Psalm. Psalm 16. A psalm possibly written by King David, or certainly well known by King David, 1,000 years before the resurrection of Christ. And we'll see in this psalm that even David understood that victory over death in the grave, the hope of eternal life, was the central truth of the faith upon which we stand. And we'll see in this psalm that David recognizes that all of the blessings that we have as God's people ride on the truth of the resurrection. Psalm 16, it's only 11 verses. I'm going to begin by reading verses 9 and 10 because they're kind of the foundation of all else that he says here. He says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Now centuries later, Peter would declare that David was acting as a prophet, seeing by faith the resurrection of the Messiah. One thing we know is that David found great comfort, great courage in the truth of the resurrection, as we do today. And David understood that every blessing that he has and he claims, every blessing we have, every blessing we claim, stands on the resurrection. David shows us in this psalm that the resurrection, the truth of eternal life, the truth of victory over the grave, demonstrates the goodness of God. In verses 2 through 6, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from me, apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, You alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have delightful inheritance. God is good. Are you convinced of it? God is good all the time. Are you convinced of it? I know sometimes it's hard to believe it. But because of the resurrection power of God, David was convinced that God is good even when life is not. He states it directly in verse 2. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. He's not only agreeing here with the Apostle James, who would much later write in James 1 and 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. But notably, David is declaring here that God is his good thing. Often we focus on the gifts that God gives us. But what I love about the Psalms is that they focus on the giver. That God is our best gift, to say the least. And that he is our good thing in this world. God is that greatest and ultimate gift. What would anything mean apart from him? And in a world that is often stained by sin and evil and darkness, God is our goodness and our light. Look to him. David said, I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on the good God. Because let's face it, life isn't always good. It was true for David, if you know his story. And I know it can be true for us as well. But as we fix our eyes on the good God, we're lifted with that hope. So David could see goodness all around him. He saw goodness in the holy people in the land. He took delight in the goodness in people. David beheld and appreciated goodness in others, those who were set apart unto God in their lives and their attitudes. David saw the value of community and with with like-minded believers, and he found delight in their fellowship. When was the last time 
you gave thanks for your fellow believers. When was the last time you allowed God to show you the goodness in others? Because he is living by faith in others. David saw the goodness in others. And David recognized how God was indeed his inheritance. In verse 5, Lord, you alone are my portion, my cup. You make my lot secure. And the New Living Translation puts it this way, Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The Good News Translation puts it this way, You, Lord, are all I have. You give me all I need. My future is in your hands. You see, as a king, David had to fight for his future. He had to fight Saul's murderous plans. And once he became the king, he had to worry about holding on to his kingdom and passing it on to his heirs uh, well. But he found rest and hope in the midst of those worries and concerns and fears about the future, when he considered the faithfulness of the good God, as can we. God promised to his people, recorded in the prophecy of Jeremiah, extends to you and me today. God said, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. David went on to say in verse 6, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. The boundary lines here literally refer to a demarcation of land. And very likely in the setting of his time, David is recognizing the greatest blessing that anyone could hope for, and that was land in the, in the, in the land of Israel, God's promised land. But that term, boundary lines, suggests to me a predetermined lot. And I'm wondering if the psalmist isn't also suggesting that the boundary lines of our lives are already mapped out and known by our sovereign good, God. And they include both pain and joy. But they are God's good plans for you and me, for his glory and our ultimate blessing. As Paul rightly declared, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The resurrection, the truth of the victory over the grave and death reveals to us God's goodness. And we see in this psalm that the resurrection also assures us that our God is worthy of praise. Let me read verses 7 through 9. The psalmist said, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. I will praise the Lord. Note that this is a definite declaration and an intentional choice. David's life, though far from easy or peaceful, we imagine a king's life as being easy and peaceful. But that often was not the truth for David, for various reasons. But even then, his life was marked by, and known for it to this very day, praising God. Let me read to you that Wonderful final psalm, the 150th psalm. Now we don't know if this was written by David. Very possibly was sung by his, him or his contemporaries. It simply says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise God with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with strings and pipes. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews thirteen fifteen, 
Therefore, through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. David's life was filled with praise. It was marked by praise. And he's particular, if he wrote this psalm, about his praise here. He says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. For a king, that must have meant a lot. Because King David had a great weight on his shoulders as he was called to lead a divided and restless people. He praised the Lord for his good counsel. And that word can also be translated as advice. In Psalm 32, God said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. But in verse 9 of that same chapter, the same psalm, he says, But do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding. You see, God offers us advice. He offers us counsel. But it is only good to us when we open our hearts and our lives and our minds to it, when we're open to God's counsel, when we're willing to follow his wise advice wherever it leads us. If you know how things went after David's time, Israel would meet a sad end because kings after David failed to be open to the good counsel of God. Let's not make that mistake. David said, I will not be shaken. My body will rest secure. It's not a boast, but it's a declaration of assurance and peace in the living God who will and does rescue his people from the greatest enemy, death. Knowing that we have the ultimate protection as we pass through this valley of the shadow of death, we are courageous, courageous, and we are at peace. In contemporary times, this truth has been expressed powerfully through a hymn that probably many of us know well, been singing it for a number of years, written by Bill and Gloria Gaither, Because He Lives. Let me read just a bit of it. It starts out, How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy that he gives. Oh, but greater still, the calm assurance we can face on certain days. Because God lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. The truth of the resurrection demonstrates God's goodness. The truth of the, revelation, of the resurrection demonstrates God's blessing. And we see also in this psalm that the truth of the resurrection demonstrates the hope and peace that we have in God. Verses 10 and 11. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David's hope and sense of security and peace, even in troubled times, was firmly based in God's promise to overcome the power of death for us. And we celebrated last Sunday the fulfillment of this promise. Jesus stated the promise, and then he authenticated it. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and uh, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Physical death has but a momentary hold over you and me. I like how Paul put it in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2. He said, for we know that if this earthly tent we live in, referring of course to our physical bodies, is destroyed by death. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. 
Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the, the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Because we know this, we know that our Heavenly Father will never abandon us. Jesus proclaimed just before his death and resurrection in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. You may be disappointed about your past, maybe even ashamed. You may be troubled about your present circumstances. But as believers in the living Jesus, in the resurrected Jesus, the one who overcame the grave, we know this this morning, our future is bright. Our struggles and our troubles come into perspective when we see them through the lens of the resurrection. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The psalmist said, I keep my eyes always upon the Lord. Let's by faith fix our eyes on the risen Christ. Father, that is our longing. It's our desire to fix our eyes on Christ, to fix our eyes on our Heavenly Father. But Lord, we confess that often our, our focus fades, we're distracted, we lose hope. Lord, we pray that each day you will anew focus us upon you. We need to see your goodness in a land of evil. We need to see your blessing in times of trouble. We need to see you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Of course, King David probably didn't know how these blessings, the goodness of God, would be seen in the future. And we know that uh, they are fulfilled in Christ, especially in his, his resurrection power that is in us and um, through his spirit. And we have access to all of these blessings in him. So let's magnify and rejoice and celebrate and lift up the risen Savior this morning. The Lamb upon His throne Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns All music but its own Awake my soul and sing Of Him who 
died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity crown him the lord of love behold his hands and side rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified all hail redeemer hail for thou for us hast died thy praise and glory shall not fail through all eternity crown him the lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save his glories now we sing who died and rose on high who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die crowned in the Lord of heaven one with the Father known one with the Spirit through him given from yonder glorious throne to thee be endless praise for thou for us hast died Amen, Roger, and thank you for sharing that closing hymn with us. Crown him with many crowns. Whenever I sing that song, I wonder, how do we crown him? Isn't he already crowned? He certainly is. But we crown him when we open our hearts and our lives to the truth, when we recognize and live our lives out with the understanding that God is king and we're in his kingdom. We talked in our service about mission, and sometimes we think of mission as being something for others. But I believe that when we live a life in which we crown the Lord as he deserves, we too can be missionaries. As you go out into this week, be a missionary. Now I know we need to go safely. We don't have those interactions that we once had. But as you have those opportunities, share the good news. Be praying for those in your family and friends who maybe don't yet know the crown, the crowned glory of God. That their hearts will be open to him. May you continue to be safe. May we begin to continue to see uh, success in, in overcoming this pandemic. And as we've mentioned many times, we look forward to the day when we can sing together physically in this building. But I've felt, and I hope that you have felt through the Spirit, that we're one. Let us pray. Father, help our eyes to stay fixed on the living Christ in this time of testing and trial, and confusion, and chaos. In this time of frustration and loss, Lord, more than maybe ever, we need to keep the eyes of our hearts and minds looking to the hills from which come our help, our redemption, our salvation. Open our hearts and our lives to you, and may we be a missionary of the good news that Jesus lives. We ask in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.